Good morning, good afternoon. This Zoom uh, recording class lecture is for Church History 2. I want to talk a little bit about our textbook just to give you a little brief uh, reading so that you can follow along the lecture. I have asked you to get a copy of this, uh, more or less just download it uh, and you would have a copy. If you want the hard copy, I suggest you get it from the school. They may charge about $25 for a copy, but if you go to FedEx, it'll cost you about $48 to get it run off, unless you have some other means to photocopy. At any rate, you can simply go and download uh, the book, and hopefully that'll be a help to you. I have endeavored to keep the cost of the textbook down. I don't think this textbook would cost a lot if you would go on one of the sites where um, you can get them for about five or six dollars, you know, where they're used books, but you can get one if you if you just want the book. That would be good that way. But hey, let's um, let's look at the book a little bit. I'll just talk a little bit about it um, with some of my notes and so forth, and. Um, uh, just kind of see what we can do. And you can always call me if you have questions. Um, I'm available. You know, if you can't get me, that means I'm somewhere um, doing something. But otherwise, I'm I'm usually here to answer the phone. Uh, got it with me. and uh, But, you know, if I get busy, I, I'm just busy. But, you know, you're still welcome to call. Or call Dr. Joyce in... Um, I don't know whether we gave uh, uh, Dr. Joyce's number or not, but certainly most students do have her number. Okay, so let's look at it. Again, uh, this is a recording, and I'm going to try and put the book on, um, on screen for you. And let's, let's see what we can do here. I'm looking. Give me a minute. Here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Just let me figure it out. Okay. And you tell me if you see. Can you can you see that? I'm not sure if if that is screen sharing. Um. Let me see if I can go back to, oh yeah, okay, here we go. Okay, I am hopeful that this is screen sharing, that you are able to see it. This is what the front of our book would look like, Exploring Church History. It is by Howard F. Boss. Howard Boss, uh, he's the author of it. It gives you a little um, copyright information, so to speak. Uh, but I tell you a little bit about the author. Uh, he is uh, was, because he's passed on, he was a professor of history and archaeology, um, emeritus to King's College. Um, and uh, so I know that he he, he died, uh, I believe, in 2019. And uh, for some reason, he's buried at Arlington Cemetery, Arlington Cemetery. But he was a scholar. And so I think that uh, there's so many books that are good books, but they're thick and they're expensive. And I've endeavored to keep the cost down. That's not always possible, I understand. And um, but let's let's keep the cost down if we can. Amen. Yes, okay. And so um here is our what's in our book is the contents. 
part one. And so we're going to start with the church in the apostolic age, the beginnings, and then we'll go to part two. So let's just start with that. We'll look at this and uh, go through your book, explore your book. Um, then uh, I will also endeavor to give you uh, handouts um, for this book, uh, for this uh, lecture. And uh, hopefully that will be of a great help to you um, uh, when we go through this history. So I'm still trying to get this together. Um, but you have your contents and the beginnings. And uh, we will have um, part two. We'll talk about early uh, church in its early development. Part three, the church in the Middle Ages. Uh, the church in during the Reformation. Uh, we'll talk about the church in modern Europe, the church in America, the church in the contemporary world. So we're going to do as much of this as we can. It's a lot to talk about and discuss. I will ask you to do some of the presentations. I like to hear you talk. I like to hear you present. So be thinking about what part you would like to talk about, whether you want to talk about early the early church, the apostolic age, you know, so that you can take a part and something that you would really like to talk about. We'll get that down and we'll make a, a schedule for it. And then um, we'll go from there so that you can present on up through the quarter so we can have you uh, bring some of this. We're looking at part one. Let's just look at part one and I want to tell you how uh, for the exam, how to study. So you you know this book is kind of heavy. It's, it's quite a number of pages. But when you look at it, take each section so it says the church in the apostolic age. We kind of figure out, we, we know about the apostolic age. This is the age. Look back at your notes. Look back at your schedule, as a matter of fact. And it will tell you that the apostolic age is when the first apostles were still alive. And the next period that we get ourselves into will actually be in the anti- Nicene period. And so that, that this this early, this apostolic age, we're talking about where the apostles were still walking and those that were walking with them. Uh, here we begin now where uh, we see that uh, we know that the certain things were happening and that's what you have to look, look at here, what the author is trying to say uh, about Jesus of Nazareth uh, we know that the crucifixion had happened and the um, uh, the resurrection, he had ascended. There's a lot of things that, that, well, before he ascended, we know that he was, there were eyewitnesses that saw him. And so a lot of things are happening. But one thing that Jesus had told the disciples was, wait, wait for a power. Wait, you're going to need some power. Wait for it. And and he made that promise not only in Acts, but he made it in the other uh, scriptures that that, that this would, they were to wait on this this power, and they were waiting. And so that's where we come to now, Pentecost. And so when you read it, know a little bit about Pentecost because this is where I take your um, exam questions. So, uh, how many followers? Who had gathered in the upper room? You know, what happened? Uh, it was on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after crucifixion, 10 days after the ascension. They were rewarded. They had been waiting. And what happened? A sound of rushing, of a rushing and, and a wind, mighty wind on uh, each of them. Something happened. So we look at this, look at Pentecost, kind of get an idea. Uh, Peter we know was there, leader of Jesus' disciples, addressed the throng. We know what he said. I asked you to go back and look at Acts, the summary of Acts, so that you could kind of get an idea. Uh, the author says here, thus the church was born. When was the church born? I'll ask you that. 
and the church was born uh, at Pentecost. During that, that time, that's considered the birthday of the church. So what else have we here? Persecution and growth. The author is giving us something here. What do we want to know about persecution and growth? Believers were not merely to enjoy a state of ecstasy. They became painfully aware that when the temple priests launched a prop persecution against them, accepting the Lord was serious business. You wanted to be a Christian, it was serious business. You were going to be persecuted. But it did something. It caused the church to grow. So we read, 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 read a little bit here about this section. Um, you know, the, the, the ones that were doing the uh, persecuting and so forth, they wanted to wipe out Christianity, but they only caused it to grow. So and then we go go and we we know about Paul's conversion. That also happened in this uh, time, and you might want to know a little something about it. Read it, scan it. Maybe you may be one of those readers that pick it up. You may not read it word for word, but you certainly can get the idea of what he's talking about. Paul's conversion. What do I need to know about Paul's conversion? Paul's missions. Here under Paul's missions. We'll talk about church growth because as Paul went, the gospel was spread. Not only Paul, but there were others that went. Um, so we we know that uh, the Christians, the, the, the Jewish Christians believed that Gentile believers had to submit to the law. And then this, is a, this will be on the exam too because what happened? Jewish Christians believed that Gentile Believers had to submit to the law as well as place their faith in Christ. So that so we know, if you know anything about the Bible, we know that uh, the Jewish Christians, which were saying to the Gentile Christians, you need to be circumcised. You need to do this. You need to do that. But you know, once they became Christians, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't come under the law, so to speak. You know, so there had to be a meeting of minds with this. And so I, I, something happened and they had a meeting. And what was that meeting called? You know, let, let, so some things had to be gotten straight there. So uh, to get an understanding, there was a council. We know that there was a council. So we look back at our schedule or at our notes, we, we can see that. In our notes, we see the beginning. We're looking at historical backgrounds. We're looking at philosophy and empire. We've seen Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, his ascension. We've talked about Pentecost or coming of the Holy Spirit. It's in your, it's in your schedule. It's in the um, course schedule. This little outline kind of keeps us on track. So a lot of things are happening. Not only uh, is there has to be a council meeting now because some things have to be gotten straight, whether the new Christians are going to have to submit to some of the Jewish um, uh, things that they were doing, like uh, what, what we just say, um, circumcision. So, you know, all these things. So there was a council and we know that council uh, met and decided some things. So and that's there in in Acts. Um, we talked about the persecutions. That's what we hear, see here in the first part of the book. So make sure you know a little something about the council um, right there. Uh, I'm, I'm just highlighting it a little bit that I can. We talked about Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, kind of know a little bit about that, his third journey. So we, we, we got the first journey, second journey, second missionary journey, the third journey. That's all there is, is for you. And we know, if you, you know anything about the Bible, you've been in church any time, you know what Paul went through. But there were other apostles. The other apostles were also active during the first century. And they evangelized areas uh, also. Bartholomew, a priest in Armenia, Andrew went to Southern Steppes, uh, the Southern Steppes of Russia, the mountains there in that area, and the Ukraine. 
So we know the gospel went to Russia and the Ukraine, Persia, India. Yes, India. And Matthew in Ethiopia. Matthew in Ethiopia, that's Africa. James the Younger in Egypt, that's Africa. Jude in Assyria and Persia and Mark. Um, so uh, in, in we see also that the, uh, remember I mentioned the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip baptized. He also took the gospel to Africa. I think that I kind of, I tried to bring that out for you for the Ethiopian eunuch that that will be on the exam. I think that's about Acts 8. And so read that so that we know how the gospel talks about the mission of the other apostles. Because what happened is the persecutions were meant to wipe this out, this new um, uh, Christianity, the, the followers of Jesus Christ. But it just caused the gospel to be spread. Um, the the tr traditions concerning the apostles and early church leaders, we'll talk about this a little bit. I may have some handouts. I do have handouts. I'll see if I can get that to you. Um, the gospel penetrated the more important in inhabited areas of Europe, Asia, and Africa by the end of the first century. So uh, Justin Martyr, remember that name. Remember that name. Um, uh, also, because we'll, we'll ask you to remember some of these names because it's important because after the apostles, then those that were walking more or less the uh, disciples of the apostles are kept, carried the word. Those became the uh, fathers of the church or in the church. And so, uh, but but you can see how, uh, and just read a little bit, kind of get an understanding. Uh, it says that in a real sense, then the pattern of evangelism laid out in Acts 1 and 8 was realized. You see that? Let's see if we can move a little faster down. Um the Apostolic Fathers, here we get into part two. So we're in part two. We're just simply walking through the book, getting what we can. As the apostles passed on the scene, remember we talked about that? What happens? Others arose in the church to take their place. Who were they? That's what I want you to know. And how they are, who they are, and how they are divided into the groups. Uh, the fathers, the apostolic or uh, apostolic fathers, the apologists, the polemicists, and the scientific theologians. That's all in your schedule. Our author is going to talk more about that. He's going to tell us more about who the fathers were, who the apostolic uh, fathers were, and the apologists. What was the, what was what were these people? Who were these people? What was their um, assignment? What were they doing? trying to do and so uh, we have a listing of the apostolic fathers um, it might be important it is important for you to know as a scholar I would venture to say this if you never went to Bible college you might not ever know who the apostolic fathers were the polemicists and uh, all the scientific theologians but you are a Bible scholar you are a Bible student. And so this class is not just your Friday night Bible study or Thursday night Bible study, whatever night you have it. It goes deep, deep into ancient history. In this case, the ancient history is church history. It is our common church history. As, as it is now, we are all into denominations most of us uh we're either baptist or we're um uh oh non-denominational or pentecostal something like that so but it's important because this is the church history our common history we we will see how that how it went because it's forming it's it's beginnings and we will see what happens so it's important that we know who these people were because they had a part in forming or, or in our church history. So there's a list in there. There's a little list in there 
I will give you more information. Um, so the apostolic fathers are characterized by edification as they sought to build up and strengthen believers in the faith. The apologists by defense against attacks on Christianity. So there were those building up the church. There were those defending the church. The polemicists by attack against heresies within the church. And the, so be, remember because the persecutions came uh, from, from without and from within the body. But we also have um, the attacks. There were not only persecutions, those physical bodily things, but there was heresy. There were uh, um, doctrines, false doctrines that were creeping in to destroy the church. So uh, the polemicists were those who, uh, and some of the scientific theologians, but there are those apologists who are trying to, um, what do you call it, um, protect the church or defend the church, but we get the scientific theologians and the um, they, they want to in, in apply some theologically, philosophically sounding things. And that's happening even today. This same thing is going on. And so when we begin to look at the author says, here's Clement. Here's uh, teachers of the early church, the shepherd of Hermas. And, that, and I'm not going to go through it because this is your reading. But I present it to you so that you'll know how to go through it for your exam. We'll talk more about it. Uh, but who was Clement? Who was the shepherd of Hermas? What did these people do? You don't have to know everything. When you want to know, let me tell you a little secret. If I want to know who the shepherd of Hermas is, I can just Google it. Okay? That's the way it is today. So I can Google that information. But here it is. The author has endeavored to put all this information down to give us scripture when necessary. And Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, who was he? It's right here for you. Why is he important to church history? What happened? Why are these people important to church history? What did they do? Were they for the church, attacking the church? Did they have some different belief? Because remember, the apostles had fallen asleep. And some of these that we see walking that right now, these are the ones that we knew that were with the apostles. Let's look at Polycarp. And it says here that he, because he was a disciple of John. You see that? He was uh, an apostle. He was a disciple of the apostle John. So we know that uh, Polycarp, it, it's important to know that. Papias. Papias, what did he do? Who was he? He became a bishop. These people became a church father. Remember when the early church, people were going from house to house and worshiping. This church now is beginning to get uh, organization. It's beginning to get um, a titles and pomp and circumstance and things like that. So <clears throat> we see that in the church, in the early church ancient church and so barnabas who was this barnabas um he originated uh a period works assigned to the period of the apostolic fathers um who who originated in north africa generally considered to have been written in alexandria well, where is alexandria where is that? I want you to tell me, be able to tell me that. Alexandria, the Didache or teachers of the 12th. I might put something on the final exam or the midterm. I'm not which one it's on. What is the Didache or teaching? Didache simply means teachings of the 12. What, why is that important? We want to know that because why? Again, we are Bible scholars. We are also ministers of the gospel. Many of us teach and preach and we prophesy, uh, bring the word of God. But for some reason, God has seen fit in these latter days that we would be well versed in our church history. 
in our philosophies, in our doctrines, in our teaching, because we live in a different age. In the age when I came up as a girl, whatever the pastor said, whatever the teacher said, that was it. But now, don't you know that people can Google you? They'll just Google whatever you're talking about while you're talking about it. They can find out. So you really need to know as scholars, because we are scholars, scholars are those who search diligently the scripture. They search diligently those things that have gone before the history. And so they are they want to know. And that's what a, a true historian is. Um, next, our author says, if you're following along, the apostolic fathers must be evaluated in accordance with their apparent purpose. That's how we evaluate them. Who were they? What did they do? What was their purpose? You know, in the formation of the early church, uh, the apostolic fathers, how did this play out as the way the church went and the church was laid out. So in this little section here, that's what the author attempts to do. Um, we, we, we learn a lot of things about how baptism, our doctrinal beliefs, if you, if you look at this, a doctrinal belief, all these things came in the ancient early church. Amen. Uh, so, so make sure you're reading this section right here. Um, the apostolic fathers must be evaluated in accordance with their apparent purpose to exhort and edify the church. Sometimes they are criticized by evangelicals because they do not seem to grasp the New Testament concept of salvation by faith or because they seem to neglect certain doctrines. It should be remembered, however, that if one's purpose is to exhort to a higher plane of Christian living, he may make rather obscure allusions to the means by which an individual becomes a Christian. In other words, I guess we don't, we weren't there. We 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 weren't there when all of this was developing, but God was. God was there, and we have what we have today because of the scramblings and the strugglings of the early church. No, these men were not perfect. And the whole thing, we did have defenders who were endeavoring to keep the gospel as the gospel was first given. And we, you will see the men of God fight for that. And so and that's why we have what we have now. And it would do well for us to try to defend what we have. So we look here now for the apologists. Remember I said that it's important that you know uh, the apologists, what they were trying to do, what, you know, just get an idea. When you read it, think to yourself, what were the apologists? What did they do? What was their purpose? And, and what were their names? And what were they trying to do? And that's how you study. Uh, the author says that apologists tried on the one hand to demonstrate the superiority of the Hebrew Christian tradition over paganism. And, and on the other hand, to defend Christianity against a variety of charges. So we know that, uh, uh, we know in that part of the world in that day when Christianity was spreading, the gospel was spreading, we have something called paganism. Many were still worshiping little G-O-Ds. And there was a hard thing for some of those who were converted they brought in some of their little G.O.D. They brought in some of their paganism ideas. And so you have to defend that uh, in that time when you have to let people know this doesn't belong in the church. Uh, images, and uh, we call them icons or images, or what some people call them um, idols. But some of these things don't believe that belong in the church. I like to use the word icon because I don't want to offend my Catholic brethren. I don't want to offend them at all because that's not my intent. Among the charges against uh, which uh, apologists defended Christianity was atheism, cannibalism. Cannibalism, because we as Christians were accused of cannibalism because we took the body and the blood, which is communion. 
We'll talk about that more. Okay, antisocial action. You know, Christians in those days would not just not eat anything. They would just not associate with anybody. But anyway, we're going to talk about that. But you're going to read and get an understanding of what each one of these uh, defenders or, or these even those that attacked the early church, what their purpose and plan and how it happened and what we have today. And even you will understand, as, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to have to defend the faith right now. We were having to defend it because some of us are becoming very political on the one hand. We're bringing politics into the church and it divides the brethren. We have seen some things come in. If we we're writing this history, we'll say, who was Trump? What did Trump do? What did he cause? What happened to some of the, the, the evangelicals, the white evangelicals? What did they do to cause the church to separate? Who were those that were defending? Who were those that were trying to bring the church back? What was going on? What men did God bring up? Or women in this in our day? Many women are standing. And we are called, as Dr. Uh, Oates would tell you, we are called to defend the faith. But we must know the word of God in order to defend the faith. You have to know the history. And I believe that's why God has given us this great uh, school, which we are really, we must surely fight to keep this uh, kind of study going forward. Justin Martyr. Who was Justin Martyr? What did he do? He said, probably the most dramatic and therefore the best known of the apologists. So he was an apologist. Justin Martyr. Who was he? Just get a little bit of background about him. Tatian, one of Justin's converts in Rome, Tatian, a native of Assyria. Because you know, when the Holy Ghost, when Pentecost came, there were people from all over the world there. And that's how that gospel spread. So know something about Tertullian, another writer of notes, sometimes classified among the apologists. Tertullian, born in Carthage, North Africa. We have to know a little bit about uh, these people. What were they doing to Christianity? Uh, the polemicists. As the Christian movement grew older, errors arose within its ranks. Errors that called for defenders of the faith and that by reaction led to the development of Christian doctrine and the formation of a New Testament canon. We'll see that when we get to chapter 8, because there are those who, if it had not been for the defenders of the faith, we would not have the canon or the Bible as we have it now. Even now, we, we have, to, have to look at the Bible and make sure that it remains true as it was originally written. We will see that because there are so many... Um, what do you call it, different versions, uh, different ideas. And because of technology, we get to we get exposed to all of those things. And they're not all good. So know the polemicists. I might not ask you, I know I won't because uh, in all detail, but I want enough of, ask you enough of, so that you would at least know, oh, the polemicists, they did this and they were blah, blah. And so, um, there are others here we're coming to, the polemicists. Here are the polemicists. Their purpose to attack Era. Who were they? We start with Irenaeus. Irenaeus. So when you look at that, say, oh, although most of the apologists lived in the East, most, most of the polemicists lived in the West. The apologists have said most of them lived in the East. Most of the polemicists lived in the West. Earlier, earliest of the group was Irenaeus, who wrote against heresies, wrote against heresies at Lyons, Lyons, however you're going to pronounce that, I believe it's pronounced Lyons, we may say Lyons, but Lyons, France, where he was bishop. Talk about that. 
All right, I'm not going to go through it. So you're going to read it. You're going to look at it and try to get an understanding. Get your little highlighter out and get some of those important points. Now, this one, Hippoly Hippolytus, uh, you know, I don't know if he was really, really that important, but he's in, he's in, the author has included him. It says, and if you look down here where it says, Hippolytus came into conflict with the dominant party in Rome because he criticized them for disciplinary laxity and doctrinal unsoundness. There are some even today will speak out against uh, uh, unsoundness, uh, doctrinal uh, unsoundness. You know, there are some of them today will say, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. That's not what the Bible is saying. You know, let's go back and, and really get the word. Let's stay with the word. Many in the pulpit today are preaching, but they're not preaching the word. They're not preaching Jesus Christ. And I would be one of those. I'm the first to say I would hear Jesus. I want to hear Jesus, not politics. Not some who did what, some great man or woman. I want to hear the word of God. This world is perishing. We need to hear from God. Well, there's Tertullian uh, in Carthage lived two other Western polemicists, Tertullian and Cyprian. Tertullian may be classified with the apologists. Okay, we see that. So we, we want to get an idea of, of these people in the early church. And it goes on here. Uh, Cyprian, modern in 258, in his polemic activity is known for opposition to Navastianism. And, and I have that on the exam, I believe. It may be in the know. What is that? That's just one of the terms. By the way, when you are studying your book and you come across something like uh, this, this word here, Novostianism, go to your glossary. Go to your glossary. It will tell you what page these things are on. And when you find that, you're like, I don't know what this is. Okay, go and go to the back of your book for anything. Where do I find Cyprian? I want to know something about Cyprian. I want to know something about Irenaeus. Go to your glossary. Go to your index so that it can tell you what page it's on because it is explained. So just go for some of these terms, some of these terms. Go to the back of your book and put your put your hand. If not, Google. That's where we are now. But when you can go right to the back of your book and understand the way that the author is trying to give it. Okay? Scientific theologians, uh, it, it says here, early development of theology. Early development of theology. And theology is the study of God. It's the study of those things uh, God-like. You know, God or, or God, well, the Bible, the history, the study of theology, it all has to do with God, and, and that's it. So we have um, uh, what, what, what we have like systematic theology, it's, it's where the theologians have systematically went through the Bible, and they have picked out or put in order the doctrines of the Bible. So when we study systematic theology, we can study bibliology, which simply says, here is the Bible. Here is the Bible. This is the Bible. We can study Christology. It's all about Christ. We can study theology. It's all about God. We can study pneumatology. It's all about the Holy Spirit. Theologians did that. They scientifically, maybe not scientifically, systematically put together these doctrines that we have, our church doctrines, our Christian doctrines, our biblical doctrines, so that we have them so that we can say, what is the doctrine of end times? When we study the doctrine of end times, it gives us what? What's happening for end times? And, and so forth. You get the idea? All right. So 
when we come, the, the scientific theologians um, uh, know something about that. They sought to apply current modes of thought to theological investigation. Moreover, they try to develop a scientific methods of biblical interpretation and textual criticism. I'm kind of, when I think about that, because that's what happened, is that science is trying to come into something that is spiritual, and we have to be careful of that. And that's why I will tell students any day, be led by the Holy Spirit before you Google. If you're looking up the word of God, and, and I believe that Google is a, a tool, any one of these things, Zoom, a Facebook, <clears throat> you name it, they are tools, but be led by the Holy Spirit first. Seek God first before you seek Google. Yeah, amen? Seek to be led by the Holy Spirit. God will lead you sometimes to the right thing on, on Google. Speak to God first because he still is speaking. He still is talking. When you're preparing a message, I prefer that you pray about what, or ask God to give you something. And so try to get the mind of God before you go to Google. And then go to your Bible and to your dictionary, your concordance and whatever else is you, you use to prepare a message. But don't just feed me what others are saying. Feed me what the word of God is saying. Talk to God first. And so the theologians are, are, are to be, we have some theologians that are godly. And you have to be careful. Some of them are writing our Sunday school books. Some of them are writing our, our Bible study books. So we have to be careful. We are theologians. We are theologians. We study. That, that's all that it means. It means the study of the word of God. The study of God things. Amen. That's who we are. We are theologians. Okay. Scientific theologians. Here they are. Of the purpose. I may ask you. What's the purpose of a, the a scientific theologian? Well, here's the purpose. Uh-huh. Who were they? Alexandria. We have a. Uh, uh, let's let's see. We have at, at, at Alexandrian theologians. Okay, we have Clement. Clement is, is one of those ones that's important. Um, who else we have? Oh, Origen. Origen, or some people may pronounce it Origen or Origen. Okay, uh, the most famous of the Alexandrian writers was Origen, who led the school from da 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 da. Therefore, he moved to Caesarea in. Palestine, where he continued his illustrious career for another 20 years until the persecution. You have to just read it. You can't read maybe everything word for word, but highlight and get the gist because that's all you want to do is get an understanding of just a little bit of who these people were, okay? Because you may never, after this class, you may not even see their name again unless you're looking at one of the Catholic churches. I happen to know some of these are... Um, uh, some of these churches, Catholic churches, I, I know St. Ignatius is in my neighborhood. There's a Catholic church called St. Ignatius. So we, we may see some of those names, okay? Um, but these were those that early defended uh, the, the church, the, the word, and so forth. The apostles' doctrine and that type of thing. Western theologians, we have the Alexandra, we said the Alexandrian theologians, and we have the Western theologians, and they are Jerome, Ambrose, um, and I'm just kind of going through it, Augustine, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, stands preeminent among theologians of all time. His influence upon all Christian faith has been significant. His emphasis on a personal experience of the grace of God as necessary to salvation has caused Protestants to accept him as the forerunner of the Reformation. Because some of these were like, wait a minute, I, I, we're getting far from what the church was. That's what their, their, their mission was, many. Many wanted to just all of a sudden, you know, you get a little power and stuff, but many were like, wait a minute, 
we can't get away from what Christ laid out or the, the apostles, the foundation of the church, of the word, more or less. We have to go by the word. So that's who some of these people were. Um, Augustine, theologians of Asia Minor and Syria, the uh, Cappadocians, uh, I, 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 if I'm reading that correctly, Cappadocians, or however you want to say it, uh, but he, well, that's who, that's who they are. Theodore, uh, John Chrysostom, Chrysostom. Uh, I know that he was a prominent leader of the Greek church, uh, but all these. Then the author gives us a summary and evaluation. Read that little summary uh, and see what he's talking about. Uh, a study of the fathers is very valuable for one interested in the development of church doctrine and organization. Because yes, this is where your church doctrine uh, came from. Yes, it's biblical. That's why when I teach Bible uh, doctrine, it's Bible doctrine. It has to line up with the word. There are so many doctrines, but if they don't line up with the word of God, then they're false. Or some people, some churches have their own doctrine, but and and a lot of churches do have their own doctrine. But we have something called Bible doctrine, church doctrine, Bible doctrine. Okay, and it's important that you, as a scholar, should know some of these things. Attacks from without. Make sure you read that. We talk about persecutions and what the author tries to do. He tries to show us the attacks from without. The Christian uh, movement had hardly begun when it faced its first persecutors. This was to be expected for Jesus himself had warned his disciples, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Not going to go into a whole lot of it. You look at it. Reason we have the Jewish fear, reasons for persecution. Persecutions come. Why persecutions coming? Jewish fears, Roman political suspicion. You know, the Romans, we remember we talked about how the how the uh the emperor, uh what's his name, Nero, he was suspicious of the Christians. People were suspicious of the Christians, social reasons. All, all of a sudden you hear um this, this is gonna change. You know, all of a sudden we got all these homeless people on the street. This this changes the whole neighborhood. This changes the whole thing of uh, thing. So we have some Christians suffered social ostracism because they came, especially in the early days, larger from the lower classes of society. And when 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 people started, when upper class people started reaching and getting uh, Christianity, then it became acceptable. We will see that when we get to Constantine, who was an emperor that converted. But now it's like, you know, we we don't those people. They they they're crazy. They got ideas. They won't bow down to this and that. They got these funny. So they, there was some social reasons why people didn't like Christians. Economic reason? Well, yeah, yeah. There, there's always that. Uh, the religious interest. I mean, uh, we saw that in the Bible. If you're a Bible student, we saw that uh, they complained when when the demons were cast out of that young woman that had. That, that had power the demons were using. Because they're like, look, you do that, nobody's gonna buy our little, 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 um, our little things that we have, our little mojos and stuff. You just, you're burning our business here. Talking about we should not have these little uh, uh, GODs and things like this and worship this. So economic reasons, of course there were religious reasons. Religiosity, Christianity itself because it was inclusivistic not tolerant like other faiths of the empire and declared only one way of salvation, not tolerant like other um, faiths of the empire. It was like you either come, come clean or stay way dirty. Okay, if I could put it like that. Roman imperial persecution, because not only are you having uh, persecution, but now you're having it like when the, when the state, we haven't been persecuted yet. We've been persecuted, but when the state and, and, and the government begins to persecute, we're in trouble. And that's what we get. Official persecution now. Official. Read that earliest official Roman persecution, imperial uh, policy. They put out a policy for the Christians. 
So the Christians are really in trouble now. They're being persecuted. And so um, uh, I'm going to go over some of this persecution across the empire. Um, make sure you read this. All this has to do with persecution. Toleration under Constantine. Please read this. This is important. Toleration under Constantine. I think we briefly talked about it a little bit. But during the confused time that followed, Constantine's son, Constantine, rose to leadership in the western part of the empire. And, and, and I want you to read that. Constantine became the sole ruler of the Roman world. Constantine um, made Christianity legal, a legal religion and favored its development in many ways. He restored property. Just read about Constantine. If you have to Google it, Google it so that you can get a good understanding. We'll, we'll learn more about him. Um, let's see. The author, we talked about persecutions, early heresies. Heresies are those things that uh, kind of crept into the church. And, you know, we get some kind of ideas, uh, 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 really some false ideas. Those are heresies. One of those was Ebionism. Ebionism. Please know that. That's one of the terms that you should know. Uh, one of the heresies. Gnosticism. I know you've seen this in your Bible, the Gnostics. Please know that term. Please know uh, the Mont Montanism. Again, I said go to the back of your book. Find out when you there's more on these. Go to the glossary. And sometimes you can go right to it and it'll explain what these things are. What these things will it'll explain to what these terms are. Early heresies in the third century. Because we remember we, we started looking at these heresies. Uh, in the first and the second century, and we come on down here now, it tells us that in the third century it talks about heresies, the early heresies. Then we have Novastianism. I think we kind of mentioned that one already. Monarch, monarchism. Monarchism. What was monarchism? Uh, because this is where uh, we, we begin to get the monarchs. The monarchs. Okay? Where um, People are in charge, and we begin to get some people that want to sit on a throne, so to speak. Uh, this one, Manichaeism, Chesism, Manchesism, however you want to pronounce that. Okay, get, learn learn those. Then we come down, we'll talk about the books of uh, for the New Testament, the formation of the canon. This is very important, formation of the canon, because it talks about our Bible our Bible, and the developments that forced the church to establish a canon. We're all over the place. We're all over the place. But somehow in the early formation of the church, the early developments of the church, the church has to sit down, come together, the body of Christ, in these councils, and there are various councils, ecumenical councils, that has to come together, we have to come together, and establish a canon, a Christian canon. Because even Islam has a canon, but we're talking about a Christian camp canon that says this is our Bible. This is what the apostles' doctrine was. This is what Christ taught. Establish a canon. So this is a really, really important time in Christianity, formation of a canon. Read that. The need for a canon. Well, I kind of talk about that. Why do we need a canon? We've got the word over here. We've got the word over here. We've got it over there. Uh, so and so got a little, you know, what do we do? What is the need for a canon? One need was so that we could all be on one page. See? Following this Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. We're going to preach. Let's all preach out of one word. Okay? Of course, the Bible has stood the test of time. The test of canonicity and the development of the canon. When certain books became accepted, there are certain books that were not in are not in our canon. There are some books that the Catholic Church has that we don't have. So we don't have those in our canon. And so the Catholic Church, you will find they have different other books. They have our books plus, plus that. 
So early list of the canon, the official list of the canon, study that the early creed, theological debates, these things took place because the church is in formation, okay? Uh, the controversies concerning the nature of Christ. This is a big one, this area and controversy. Make sure that you are familiar with that. I think if you look at the, the schedule or the outline, it will say even the Catholic Church was against this controversy, this heresy, okay? So make sure you look at that. Uh, controversy concerning Christ's humanity, uh, Constantinople, the Nestorian controversy, there were all kinds of things in the early development. There's still things now that we face that are still going on that we need to be aware of. And we need to study, again, Dr. Oates would say, study to show yourself or study to, how are you going to defend the faith if you don't know the word? of God. How can you defend the faith? And you know, and we as scholars, that's that's probably why God has called us to a higher learning is so that we might have uh some history of what's going on. If you never know uh what happened to your people and that's why we're handicapped as as uh the black people are handicapped because we don't always know our history. We don't we don't have that history of where we came from. We know we, we're from we're from Africa as our homeland, but where did we come from? Who was our great, 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 great grandfather? You know, we can't trace it back like that. But you have power when you know, when you have history. And then it, it's good for us to know our Christian history, our common Christian history, because then that way we, we won't be deceived. Amen. And and controversies concerning the Holy Spirit. Controversies concerning humanity. Um, I'm not familiar with this one. Plague, peg, peglianism, Pelagianism, I'm not familiar with that one, but study that. Oh, maybe I am. But to, let's, let's look at that. We'll look at that one together. Augustinianism, this is, this is you know, we have August, and this is simply uh, the, some, the men, the Augustine. And, and the, this is what comes from them, what people, some people follow different people and their name, the, the whatever the, the movement is, is named after that person. Okay. Um, Ignatius, the church in the middle ages. And so we're, we're gonna stop here because uh, I don't wanna go too far because I, I just wanna get you familiar with uh, Ignatius, Uranius, you, we've already talked about them the rise of Rome and so forth, we see that. And so I want to stop here, but I, I want you to have this lecture um, because it will help you advance in the cause of, of the prophecy. We'll stop right here. Now you're really caught up into your reading and um, please read, go back and read, take this lecture. It may take you a couple of days to kind of read this, but that's what you do. You've got it on the screen. Just read it and see what you can do with it. I'm going to stop share right here. Hopefully you have gotten something out of this lecture to bring you up to snuff. We went through quite a bit of it, uh, but when we meet again, we're going to go back to part one and we'll sort of talk about it um, so that you can get a, a, a really understanding of it. And I'll ask you to talk about it. I want you to talk about some of those things in part one, part two, because we went quite in depth to it today because I want to get you through it because I really want to talk about black history. God bless you on this afternoon. This is Professor Butler.